lying on the street or on the railway line or in a muddy pond. There often seems to be something poignant about them. It's something photojournalists have noticed, and that's why they often focus in on the solitary shoe after the storm. Now the reporter Kim Normanton goes to Transport for London's Lost Property Office to begin her exploration of the uncanny power of shoes. I'm Anne and I work in the lost property stripping department down in the basement. These items would have come from taxis, buses or underground trains. We get about 600 items a day and have different categories of items. For instance, cosmetics, lunch boxes, shoes. I'm Shirley Hughes, and I'm an author-illustrator for children. Of course, a place like this is full of items, which it would be very interesting to have my sketchbook with me, which I haven't at the moment, because I'm so amazed that people should have left these things behind. Let's have a look at the shoes, then. Well, there's a great bag of shoes here, all sizes. Yes. What sort of person do you think lived in them? Well, first of all, I've pulled out a pair of women's shoes. Um, they're black patent leather with high... Spike heels, very pointed toes, they look terribly uncomfortable. I think they might have belonged to a woman who bored stiff with yet another evening with her husband glued to his computer, thought she'd put them on, go out to a party. But, of course, they started to hurt on the way there. Stood around for a couple of hours, glass in hand, and it was a bit of a disappointment. So she thought she'd come home, but she was limping by this time got to the station, just took them off and left them there. Walked home in bare feet. But, of course, I'm into happy endings, so I think when she got back, her husband said, Darling, I'm so glad you're back early. I've missed you. And she sat on the sofa with her feet up and he made her some supper. You may be going through a suitcase or a rucksack and you'll come across people's photographs... Some are very old photographs, and that's very sad, you know, that they didn't get them back because they probably meant so much to them. My name is Katrina and I'm researching into my father's life. I've got a selection of photographs of my father from 1938 up until 1964. Um, and they show him, well, he was, a, he was a giant, he was a pituitary giant and made him grow to a terrible height. Ultimately, he was seven foot four and a half. When he was 23, he decided that in the 1930s, he could earn more money by acting. When I remember my father, he was quite old. He was, well, he was in his early 50s, but because of the disease, it made him seem older. The photographs that I love show him when he was young and handsome and having a great time because the troupe that he, he, he became involved in, he became involved in a big uh, review that travelled to Berlin and Munich in 1938 and it was called Durley's Tropen Express and it was a huge, huge um, show and, and it, all, it all looks so much fun and so exciting. There's a kind of, there's a short, it looks like a vignette from King Kong 
Obviously, my father is uh, is playing King Kong. I've been told that my father was very embarrassed about what he did, and I suppose there was an element of a circus. But if my father was around now at the age of 90, I think he'd look upon these photographs and not not be embarrassed anymore and think, well, you know, I lived and it was fun and what an exciting time to be in Berlin. I hope he wouldn't be embarrassed. I can remember my father's shoes quite clearly. He was in a wheelchair from when I was three. And I suppose as a child you sit a lot at your father's feet and... I can remember them. They were lovely brown shoes and they had nice laces, nice hard round laces on them. Because, well, they were big, of course, but then everybody's shoes were big to me when I was three. And I don't ever remember. People say, oh, you know, your father must have seemed so big to you, but of course he didn't. We were in incredibly close. He, My mother had to go out and work. And so he really looked after me and I looked after him. And so we were inseparable, really. And um, he would wash and I, he couldn't reach down to his lower limbs. So I would wash his knees and down his legs and wash his feet. And then I would dry his feet very carefully. I can remember picking his shoes up to put them on. I remember how heavy, you know, trying him and I... And then there was a the laces question, of course. You know, he'd be trying to teach me how to tie laces while I was tying his laces, uh, which is which was nice. My father was in hospital. He'd fractured his femur. My brother and sister and I had to go down to stay with my grandparents to be looked after. And um, he died when we were down there on the 3rd of August. And... I suppose, well, we weren't allowed to go to the funeral. Children really weren't encouraged to do so at that time. And by the time we got back to the house, everything was different. The, the, the room that had, that had been his bedroom had been completely cleared. There was, you know, the big bed had gone. and None of his clothes were there. And his shoes were, were gone. Later on, when I was, I was a, it's hard to it's hard to describe how it felt. But later on, I was a district nurse. I was nursing an elderly gentleman who'd been a, a Spitfire pilot. He died during the night on one of you know that week. And when I went into the room, the covers of the bed that he'd been in had been thrown back but the bed hadn't been stripped and the bed was still in the shape of his body you know the the the, the mattress had and that was his shape that was there in the mattress and I, I remember being terribly moved by this sudden absence and I think when we came back home it was somehow worse I don't know it's hard, it's hard to put it into words. Um, but I suppose my mother just wanted to look to the future and not to the past. Thames foreshore, or beach as I prefer to call it, opposite the Globe Theatre. There are mudlarks on the beach. Now mudlarks 150 years ago used to come along very often children and collect anything that they'd find on the beach that could possibly be recycled. And any time that the tide is low you'll see people down here hunting, hunting for artefacts. What we're looking at is shoes that people have finished with or lost. Um, I've never found a pair. So they're always one-offs? Yeah, and every shoe is different. 
in the past everything would have been repaired and recycled and repaired again. A lot of the shoes will have little studs around the edges to help stop wear, but this thing actually stood out because the, the, the sole was absolutely covered in iron. The very sad thing is that as the shoes started to dry out, so the leather started to shrink, and in fact what's left now is a, a, a fairly shriveled piece of leather with some very tiny bits of metal left, which is sad because this had obviously been a work boot that had seen pretty hard life to be discarded at the end of a long life and to shrivel to this rather insignificant looking thing now, but I still can't get rid of it. I've still got to keep that because I know what it looked like the day I found it. Shoes are very personal. I mean, when I first found it, you could still see the impression of the foot inside. Nothing. I Lithuanian immigrant, I know nothing. So now those long pointy shoes in medieval times, you wouldn't have been able to walk upstairs with them, would you? Because your toes are banging to the next step up, so you'd have to walk sideways. Is that just vanity? Well, it must have been vanity, mustn't it? And just think, they didn't have a tread on the bottom of their shoes. So when they came down the stairway, which would probably be wooden, and the river was full of fish, so that means there would have been loads of algae or algae, however you say it. The process then goes, shoes with no tread, slippery wooden stairs, people slipping over, things getting lost. Does that make sense? It does make sense. That is why wherever there's an old stairway, or the where you know there was once an old stairway, is where you find stuff. Not maybe. And, and do you ever find um, like pairs of shoes together, or no. is it always singles? No, only singles. You wouldn't lose a pair to get. Well, you, unless you, de you were dead, it was a body in the water then the shoes would gradually fall off his feet. But in that instance, one might be over there and the next one would be over here. You know, they wouldn't be together like, I mean... Mike, do you remember about two weeks ago when those two drunks got stranded somewhere yeah. in the mud? <laughs> they get one foot stuck in the yeah, mud. So and... there's all those shoes where the wool came out, isn't it? <laughs> really? The legs break off, do they? <laughs> what do you mean they got lots of person inside? That's a strange suit. What have you been telling this young lady? This is a right foot, this one here. That's a right Yeah, that's the same way, right? Is it? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. That's actually a left foot, isn't it? I'm Francis Grew. I'm a curator of archaeology at the Museum of London. How many years old is it? This is an extraordinary shoe, actually, which is, uh, well, about 1380 in date. So very it's small it very, is. Very, very small. And it's a very, very well-made shoe by the look of it. Almost. It was sort of a first shoe, I think, that a child must have had. And very, very similar to children's or baby's shoes, really, that you see today, a little sort of booty, really. People were, even then, designing, really, uh, special types of shoes for their children to wear. And I wonder if this child was actually old enough to tie their own laces. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thought, isn't it, really? <laughs> this little shoe here reminds me of the elves and the shoemakers. Look at the how fine the stitching is there on the side. It's really terribly fine. It's almost you wonder whether children were actually almost making these things. I always think that when you look at these things, you're very, very close to the people who actually wore these, these things. Is there any particular shoe that you, when you first came to this collection, you remember? I think it would have to be this little shoe here, which is, it really is my absolute favourite object. It's a little child's boot here. The thing I, I love looking at here is it's slightly pointed toe, but look how it's creased across the toe and it's been stubbed in here on the, on the toe. I, I love to imagine that this child had actually been kicking a ball or kicking a piece of furniture, you know, as children do, and it's stubbed in the toe there. Just a fantastic insight into the person who wore that shoe, I feel.
I've got, there's a lovely boy's shoe here. It's a nice, sturdy, brown leather shoe. Uh, I think children's shoes are always touching. And I think a lot of us have got a tiny shoe that they, we just couldn't bear to throw away because possibly a first shoe. This is for a child of about seven, I suppose, six, seven. Perhaps a little chap who's going off on his first school journey and lost his shoes uh, at the outset. He was that sort of kid. But when he got in the coach just before they were due to leave, a wildly dishevelled figure came running up the pavement and it was his mum who, by that kind of osmosis that mothers have, thought he'd better have another pair and she handed them in. He waved nonchalantly as she stood panting on the pavement, waving back. So it, that, another happy ending, in fact. I, yes, yes. How do you decide which shoes to put on your characters? Well, feet and hands are very eloquent. They have charged with emotion. And when I'm drawing pictures for somebody who can't yet read, which is a very young child, they're seeing all the action in the pictures. So with a character like Alfie, I pay, pay very careful attention to his, to his shoes and his feet. In fact, I've done a story in which he, he has a pair of new boots and that's a, a whole exciting adventure for some of his age. Yes, feet, very important. And um, with Alfie, you know, they show emotion. They, they show his feet, or whether he's in his shoes, whether he's feeling very tentative and shy or rather upset, or whether he's stepping out confidently. Oh, that's nice. These would be his confident shoes, wouldn't they? Do you think that shoes are more connected to the owner than the rest of their clothes? Is there a sense of person left behind in the shoe? I remember a very sad poem about what do you do with a woman's shoes now that the woman is dead. I mean, that's, that's the saddest thing, is someone who's left their shoes behind. As you say, they, they're very, very poignant, because they're a pair. Have you ever had to clear out someone's shoes after they've gone? Once. I've illustrated many fairy tales in my time and, of course, shoes are terribly important in folklore. There are seven-league boots and shoes where you're invisible. There's Puss in Boots, of course, and that horrifying story, The Red Shoes, by Hans Andersen, which scared the life out of me as a child, where the girl is condemned to wear these red shoes and dance on forever. Robert Upstain and I'm a curator at Tate Britain. I am the person who looks after William Nicholson's work here. The picture that we're looking at now is his uh, painting of the boots of Gertrude Jekyll. Gertrude Jekyll was one of the great Edwardian gardeners. She really evolved the idea of the cottage garden. She was extremely well known, but she was a very uh, shy, uh, sort of person. Gertrude Jekyll insisted on spending every daylight hour gardening. Nicholson said he didn't waste his time, he painted her gardening boots. Nicholson describes them as army boots. They're black, lace-up, chunky, hobnailed boots, tough boots. She was totally devoted to her gardening, that she'd never married. She worked long hours, application, hard labour, all these things. And it's almost as if these seem to symbolise that life. What could people tell about you by your shoes? Oh, suede nice. Boots. <laughs> Brown suede boots. <laughs> Do you think if he'd painted just one shoe or one boot, it would have been more of a memorial? Where I think if there were one, the question would be, what's happened to the other one? What was the story? It almost suggests a narrative. I think, I think there is a sense of emptiness. It's a bit like, you know, when you do um, see an elderly person's room where they've lived for, for the last 20 years and everything will be within arm's reach of a, the chair that they've sat in and it's actually incredibly uh, uh, evocative and emotional to sort of see that pack of fags sitting next to the table or something, you know, that, 
kind of simple object which seems to summarise daily life, ordinary life. When an object is well used by somebody, it's almost as if there's some kind of invisible transferal of their personality or their physical presence, at least, into the object itself. The echo of somebody who's been there. I remember a, a story about a, an elfin creature who tried to be like a real child, and she managed a hat to cover her pointed ears, but she couldn't make her feet touch the ground. So she forced them down and walked on points to try and make herself uh, look like a human child. I'm June Swan and I'm at present consultant on the history of shoes and shoemaking. But before that I worked for 38 years in Northampton Museum with the largest collection of historic shoes in the world and a fantastic collection to work with. So I've seen a lot of shoes. <laughs> Shoemakers all said they could tell a lot about customers by looking at the shoes, and a lot of shoe students do as well, um, depending how tarty they are. As most girls dress as tarts these days, it doesn't make much difference. But uh, Can you tell me what are concealed shoes? I wish I could. <laughs> it's a term I gave to them uh, my boss thought, at the time thought I was mad, and you know, if, if you've got them, they're not concealed. And I said, well, they were deliberately hidden. And instead of saying deliberately hidden shoes, I call them concealed, so we're stuck with it now. How did you first come across these concealed shoes? I was particularly puzzled, and that was really, it still bothers me now sometimes when I think about it. Pair of child's shoes, and the story was that they were found in the thatch of a roof out in the county, but I thought, you know, I had this vision of this small child just learning to walk somehow on the roof and losing its boots. And of course, knowing by that time how valuable and expensive boots and shoes had always been, and to have lost a pair and this poor child upon the thatch, uh, it was a very strange feeling. And it was only a few weeks later when I was talking to the head of the boot and shoe department at the Tech, John Thornton. He came in one day and said, I've had six or seven shoes found under floorboards and up the chimney. And I said, that's funny, so have I. And it was then we both realised with that number that they weren't accidental and that this had to be some sort of practice. I'm not superstitious, although my mother was, and so I'm, you know, a bit anti-superstition. First of all, one leaps to conclusions, of course, because we knew that shoes were linked with fertility, because you still tie them on the back of the wedding car. They also express the wearer's personality, and of course, when they've been well worn, as all the concealed, or practically all the concealed shoes are, they've very much taken on the personality of the wearer. And I began to think, oh, well, they're standing in for the wearer. Maybe it's Joe Bloggs was here, you know. You know, I am here, I don't want you interfering with my property. Almost like consecrating the building. I don't know whether anything was said when it was done, we don't know. The most popular place is the chimney, centre of the household. It's where you all sit in the evenings and huddled round it right from, certainly from Homer's time in ancient Greece, if you disturb the land or the sea, you made a sacrifice first. And is this linked with those sorts of sacrifices? Put a shoe in, it's valuable, and it's part of you. The most recent one that I know about is 1991. This is not some practice that has died out. It's like the opposite of Father Christmas, really. Instead of beckoning down this jolly thing to come and bring you things, you're kind of, I'm waiting down here. Well, we um, don't want anything nasty coming 
Yes, mm. uh, there was. Uh, there are various 17th century pictures um, about witchcraft, and you see the witches actually flying out of the chimney in these 17th century woodcuts, particularly in Germany. Uh, so it, it's uh, you know it's a, obviously a dangerous place, and but it was when I got to these two that I really, I. As I say, I'm not a superstitious person, but I just didn't like the looks of these. I thought they were vile. Slashes, oblique slashes across the whole front. And I thought, that's nasty, I don't like it. But the other one is the absolute pits. It's been cut, uh, the whole of the front cut, so into small straps, what is it, quarter of an inch, half an inch wide, and they almost fall into interweaving. Now, this is a th man's leather shoe, um, sturdy for a working man, and but somebody spent, was it a wet afternoon, hacking away at this thing until it's almost down to the sole. And I sort of, eventually I began to think, I hope nobody uttered a spell against whoever it belonged to, because... I did wonder whether that had happened. It's it's uh, nasty. But this is very much the exception. I must stress that. Sort of like some kind of voodoo thing where, you know, you stick Almost. things in someone. Almost, yes. But it's pure speculation. And um, so, so do you feel at all anxious talking about them? Yes. There are two aspects of shoes. There's things like the children's shoes that sometimes t turn up in the main bedroom walls or up the chimney there. And then there are these things that may be linked with evil. And I think we just have to acknowledge that there's good and evil in this world. And the shoes are a good example of that. Is it just a cliche or do you think there's some grounding in this idea of sadness connected to a lost shoe? Not sadness so much as magic. Magic? Yes. was presented by Kim Normanton. Taking part, among others, were Anne Creaser, Francis Grew and Mike Webber. Thanks also to the museums of London and Northampton. The producer was Matt Thompson. And If the Shoe Fits was a Loftus production for BBC Radio 4. It's half past eleven, and just before the next programme, we're crossing now to Charlotte Green in the newsroom. A man has been shot by police at Stockwell Underground Station in South London. An eyewitness told the BBC he saw a man run onto a train pursued by three officers who pushed him to the floor and shot him five times. He said he thought the man had died. There are reports that armed police have surrounded the East London Mosque. Its director, Dilwar Khan, told us the building had been evacuated because of concerns that there may be a bomb inside. Police haven't confirmed any details.